the horror yet remaining amongst us of the barbarous design of such villains in September 1663, Governor Sir William Barclay referencing the Gloucester Servants Plot. There was a time between the 1630s and 1670s when enslaved Africans and European servants shared a common cause and sometimes the common lash. They did not, however, share a common outcome. This is the story of that lost opportunity and the beginning of racial separation in Virginia. In our first video, we looked at the complicated origins of the first Africans in Virginia, which involved Portugal, Spain, Congo, Dongo, and Bengala mercenaries and English privateers. In our last video, we examined the spectrum of English attitudes towards African people and the small but growing free black population of 17th century England. The form of slavery most familiar in American history class emerged during the 18th and 19th centuries. This is not to say that the 1619 Africans were willing immigrants or that white servants were enslaved, but to examine how courts, rebellions, legislation, and custom evolved from a more varied and fluid form of unfree labor to the race-based form of chattel slavery abolished in 1865. 1625 was to be an important year for the history of Africans in Virginia. It was six years after the arrival of the White Lion and Treasurer, five years after Virginia's first census, the 1620 muster, which recorded the names of some of the first Africans. In January 1625, a more thorough census took place, especially as it followed the 1622 Powhatan Uprising and subsequent war. Of the 1,232 colonists and bonded people in Virginia, only 23 were African. The numbers indicated Africans succumbing to the same mortality rates that affected the English. But a hundred more Africans would arrive three years later, mostly Angolans. 1625 is also the last year Angela of Jamestown appears in any records. Her fate for now left uncertain and to the continued research of Jamestown rediscovery archaeologists. 1625 would also bring the first landmark court case of an African status in Virginia. Captain Nathaniel Jones, while privateering in the Caribbean, captured a Spanish frigate. He also took a Portuguese pilot as well as a Frenchman and a black man named Brace or Brass. The Frenchman and African apparently joined willingly, hoping for a life of freedom, maybe piracy and prizes, or perhaps a new life in England. But storms prevented Jones from setting sail for England, and he made the fatal decision to head to Virginia. While selling some of his prizes in Virginia, the matter of the captives was taken to court. The two white men were free to go, but Brace was not. He was sent to work at the Yardley Plantation and later for Governor Francis Wyatt. For wages, yes, it is clear, but his labor was determined by the court. In a land with no previous legal precedent for slavery, custom yet ruled the land. An English court for the first time had ruled on an African's labor not for punitive purposes. By 1640, enslaved Africans and indentured Europeans began to act in concert together and run away. The General Court, the highest court in Virginia, began to respond to the problem of runaways. On July 9, 1640, Hugh Gwynn brought back three runaways who had escaped to Maryland. They were Victor, a Dutchman, likely German, a Scotsman named James Gregory, and a black man named John Punch. Each man received a sentence of 30 lashes on his back. The two white men had to serve the rest of their indentures, while John Punch was sentenced to serve, quote, for the time of his natural life, unquote, the first court sentence of a black man to lifelong slavery as a punishment found in the Virginia records. That same month, a mere three weeks later, the general court heard the complaint of Captain William Pierce, the master of Angela, about several runaways. Pierce had a separate plantation from his Jamestown property. Six of Pierce's white indentured servants and a black man named Emmanuel from a neighboring plantation stole Captain Pierce's skiff 
powder, shot, and guns and headed down the James River towards the Elizabeth River. And they were caught. One of the white men said to be the ringleader was a Dutchman. All the men were punished, most with 30 lashes. Three, including the black man, Emmanuel, had a letter R branded on their cheeks. Years were added to their service between one to seven years for their contracts, while several were subjected to do their labor while shackled. In both cases, punishments varied, but all were punished. Planters in Virginia began to fear whites and blacks acting in solidarity. Planters were conspiring, litigating, and advocating to keep people on the plantation as long as possible through contract, punishment, or even flouting the law. But not all of these litigants were white. In 1655, in March, the General Court heard the case of John Castle of the Eastern Shore, a black man held in the service of another black man named Anthony Johnson. Johnson first arrived in Virginia in 1621. In any case, by the 1650s, he had been freed and became quite successful, acquiring 250 acres of land and controlling the labor of European servants and enslaved Africans. Yet John Castle claimed he was actually indentured and came to Virginia with the promise of serving only seven or eight years. But Castle claimed to have been kept seven years longer than his contract and left Johnson to work for wages for a white man named Robert Parker. Parker and his brother claimed to have seen the contract, while Anthony Johnson claimed that no contract existed. Castor claimed Johnson was fearful of losing assets, even though Castor claimed that Johnson's wife and children were even on his side. The court ruled for Anthony Johnson. In 1655, it was possible for a black man to have white servants, own land, own enslaved Africans, and testify in court, and even win against the white man. Johnson's motivation may have been to play the system that so far had worked for him. Yet just a few years later, the Virginia General Assembly would act to prevent exceptions like Anthony Johnson to ever become the rule. Yet the following year, another interracial case would push the Assembly to step in and act. In 1655, a black woman sued in a Virginia court and won her freedom. Her name was Elizabeth, Elizabeth Key. Her mother was an unknown to records enslaved African woman, but her father was the Virginia planter in Denby Burgess, Thomas Key. That means Elizabeth was born in what is now Newport News between 1630 and 1632. Her story becomes complicated, but essentially Elizabeth's father Thomas returned to England and Elizabeth was bonded to her godfather Thomas Higginson for nine years who promised to treat Elizabeth as his daughter, agreeing to free her if she was ever taken to England or he died or nine years, whichever came first. Years passed and the promises were not kept. As a John Matron bought Elizabeth and she was by 1655 a resident of Northumberland County on the northern neck of Virginia. That year, Matram dies and Elizabeth sued for her freedom in the Northumberland County Court. To complicate matters, Elizabeth had been in a relationship with William Grinstead and they had a son together. He was likely an indentured servant on the Matram estate. Grinstead served as an attorney in fact, not law, meaning he had to stand legally in Elizabeth's place as a woman could not represent herself. Grinstead was not legally trained or likely even literate. Another attorney, an attorney of law, drew up the actual paperwork. The Northumberland County jury awarded Elizabeth her freedom due to common law principles as she was born of a free father and was a baptized Christian. Her enslavement was also deemed a violation of contract. Elizabeth's freedom upheld appeal at the General Court at Jamestown as well as the approval of the General Assembly which investigated the matter. She did have two more children and married another Englishman after Grinstead dies. Her descendants were simply presumed to be English or the issue was just ignored. By the 1660s, enslaved and indentured Africans, enslaved Indians and indentured whites worked in the same fields, side by side, slept in the same houses, fell in love, had children, ran away, and even rebelled together. What is clear in the records is that the Virginia elite wanted to discourage such unions through decree and through use of the lash. What is also clear is that it was not working. In an age of English rebellion, 
that overthrew a king and saw him beheaded, armed men, indentured and enslaved, would take up guns to seek justice. Indentured servants, although willing immigrants for the most part, faced cruel conditions, breaches of contract, and a high mortality rate. While they could sue masters in court by 1657, there were punitive measures for those who failed to win their cases. In 1661, 40 York County servants, who were enraged at the lack of promised meat in their diet, decided to pass by the courts and take up arms to make demands and gain their freedom through force. They were betrayed and arrested, but appeared to be let off with light punishments and the promise of better treatment. If 1663 is any indication, that treatment did not improve very much. That fall, a group of nine servants in Gloucester County met in secret to plot against their masters. Their plan was to meet up a week later with scavenged firearms and more followers. Following the raising of a company, testimony later stated that the plotters would march from house to house, seizing guns, gathering men, and killing all of those who opposed them. The band would then march to Greenspring, Governor Sir William Barclay's palatial estate outside Jamestown, to demand their freedom and kill the aristocratic governor if they had to. The would-be rebels were betrayed. Barclay was outraged and made certain the ringleaders were hanged. Rumors spread that many of the plotters were convict laborers, while others were former Cromwell supporters. A romantic novel published in 1889 suggested that black men were a part of the Gloucester conspiracy too, but there is no evidence either for or against this assertion. But the next revolt against Barclay, however, would be interracial. In 1675, a case of localized violence and mistaken identity on the northern fringes of Virginia became the spark that nearly toppled Sir William Barclay. He had been a charismatic and popular first-term governor whose rule ended with the overthrow and beheading of King Charles I and the rise of the Puritan Oliver Cromwell. Barclay would pay for his and Virginia's loyalty to the crown by losing his job. With the restoration of the crown in 1660, however, came the return of Stuart Loyalist Governor Barclay, but his second term saw the aging governor as out of touch and accused of cronyism. Virginia was becoming a land of haves and have-nots, haves being connected cavaliers and tobacco planters, have-nots the large enslaved, indentured, and newly freed population of the frontier. These people felt the brunt of Native American attacks along that frontier. Added to the list of have-nots were the Native Americans themselves, those outside Virginia that suspiciously eyed the colony's growth, and the remnant of the Powhatan people who thought they could rely on the treaties and the governor's promised help. Racial violence erupted along the Potomac, bringing the Susquehanna tribe to strike the Virginia frontier. Black and white Virginians, bonded or poor, were among the victims. Nathaniel Bacon, a young aristocrat, became their champion and formed his army from among the discontented and was especially popular where the servant plots had been hatched only a decade before. Bacon soon challenged Barclay and fought a two-front war against aristocrats and Virginia Indians no matter the Native Americans' allegiance. More on this in a future video series. What is known is that by July 1676, Bacon promised freedom to enslaved Africans and indentured whites. An integrated army burnt Jamestown to the ground that September. While ultimately the rebellion was crushed, among the last holdouts were 20 white men and 80 black men who knew they would not be receiving a pardon from Barclay. This garrison, located near West Point, Virginia, would be marched off in chains the last such integrated arm rebellion of this kind until arguably 1859. There was, however, another plot that doesn't get mentioned much in 1687. Westmoreland County in the northern neck, there were growing fears of slave uprisings due to the isolated location of the county, growing African population, and small number of patrols. 
Increasingly, legislation targeting black property rights fueled these tensions. In October, a panicked planter wrote the Virginia governor, Baron Effingham, about a slave conspiracy. The planter claimed to have all the details. The area planters formed a special court to handle the conspiracy. There was no record of what happened to the suspected black rebels, or the veracity of the plot in the first place. But based on the reaction of area officials, it is likely capital punishment was implemented. In the 1630s and 1640s, there were attempts to punish white servants from racial intermarriage. It did little to stop the practice. By the 1650s, court cases showed a few examples of white and black unity. In the case of Elizabeth Key, John Cassor, and the servants and enslaved Africans who ran away together. By the 1670s, white and black rebels threatened the authority of the governor and the social order of the colony. But it was not to last. In response to Elizabeth Key's successful suit for freedom, the Virginia General Assembly passed a law which superseded English common law that henceforth the status of the mother, not father, determined the status of the child. By 1667, Baptism and conversion to Christianity would no longer bring freedom. There would no longer be any future Elizabeth Keys. By 1669, new legislation encouraged planters to punish white servants through extended contracts, while slaves, their word, could only be corrected by violent means. Slaves killed by masters while resisting would no longer constitute a felony for the master. Three years later, any non-white runaway could legally be killed on sight, with owners receiving financial compensation for their loss. Following Bacon's Rebellion, laws were passed prohibiting the congregation of enslaved Africans and prohibited black possession of firearms. By the 1690s, black Virginians, both free and enslaved, were denied ownership of hogs, cattle, and horses. Racial intermarriage was outlawed, and those freed from slavery were required to leave Virginia within six months. Meanwhile, white indentured servants gained more freedoms, including the status of white, first used as a legal definition by 1690. By 1705, after the capital moved to Williamsburg, these slavery laws were further strengthened. But as a nod to racial separation, those same laws included a clause that forbade the whipping of white servants by their masters. Dawn of the 18th century Unity was gone, one of America's lost opportunities for a different racial path. Something to think about.